Okay, so today is going to be an experiment because uh, I always used to give talks with a tablet computer, but my last tablet computer broke, and I uh, and I didn't want to buy another one because there are going to be a whole lot more on the market, and so I have an iPad, and I'm going to be using the iPad to give the talk, and I have to write on it, but it's not so good for writing on, so we'll see how it works. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, start with <clears throat> the sort of overall goal of the work I'm going to be talking about. And uh, in order for evolution to work, the neural circuits in the brain have to have an interesting property, which is they have to have a scalable architecture. When Intel uh, needs to make a more powerful computer, even if they use the same design and just use a different technology with smaller wires, they have to redesign the whole thing. But biology can't afford that luxury. What it has to do is it has to be able to make a computer that is more powerful, can handle more data, do more things, uh, w without doing anything other than just making it bigger. And so the goal of the work that I've been doing for the last few years is to, is to discover the design principles that, oh, I, I, thought, I thought David was out of town. The, 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 to discover the design principles that, <laughs> uh, to, to discover the, the, the design principles that brains use that endow their neural circuits with an, a scalable architecture. This sounds a little vague, but when it comes down right down to it, it's all quite specific because you can't find all of the rules at once. You have to find the rules one at a time. And over the past uh, four or five years, I've, I've found about a half dozen of these. Some are fancier and some are simpler. And today, I'm going to be giving you uh, an example of, of one of the various simple, simplest of the design principles that brains use. Normally, what I would do at this point is I would say what the design principle is, and I would, uh, and and then I would uh, go on to say where it came from or why you would believe it or something. But the trouble is that right now I have to establish some terminology before I can even say what the problem is. And so what I'm going to have to do is uh, insult most of you or many of you by telling you things that you already know most of you better than I do, uh, but just so that everyone knows, uh, knows what the, the, the terminology that I'm going to be using. And at that point, I'll be able to tell you what the design principle is and then try to give you evidence in favor of it. <clears throat> and I'm going to sit down so I can write better. Okay, the first thing is to talk about the basic components of a neural circuit, how a neural circuit's made. And a neural circuit is made by having, uh, having neurons. Every neuron has a cell body. Where that's, where the, that's where it keeps its DNA for making all of its proteins. And then sticking out from the cell body are a bunch of very fine tubes that look like this. And these are called dendrites. You can't write very small on these things. And the ones I'm used to, you can write really small on, but, but you have to write just uh, big. And this is neuron one here. And these are dendrites. And also, there is another very thin tube. And by thin, I mean uh, on the order of one micron in diameter, hollow on the inside. And uh, there is another one, that, uh, another thin tube that comes out that, g that runs across like that, and this is called an axon. And basically, what the dendrites do is they collect information that is presented to them by other axons. They integrate that information. They do computations on it of a sort. And then they encode what they got in terms of nerve impulses and send them over to the next, uh, next neuron. And here is neuron number two. Neuron number two also has uh, dendrites. 
and where neuron number one touches the dendrites of neuron number two, it can make connections. Uh, so these are the dendrites of neuron number two. Neuron number two also has an axon that, go, that goes someplace. And where neuron number one touches num neuron number two, there are some specialized structures, and these are called synapses. And synapses are the points where information is sent from neuron one to number two. Okay, so basically all the neural circuits are just this. There are neurons with a lot of dendrites that collect information, and there are an axon that goes and sends information to other neurons. But this figure that I've drawn is incredibly misleading for the following reason, that each neuron sends, uh, sends, makes synapses, sends information to about 10 to the fourth other neurons. and receives information from about 10 to the fourth other neurons. So a given neuron has on the order of 10 to the fourth synapses. And these axonal arbors that I drew here actually spread out, these axons actually spread out, and they, and they make an arbor like this that spreads information over, over part, of the, part of, the, uh, of the neural circuit. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about are the neurons, the dendritic arbors, and the axonal arbors of those making neural circuits. Now, I'm going to be talking today about, um, uh, uh, about the, uh, 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 a particular neural circuit that's simple, and that particular neural circuit is the retina. And that retina, that, the retina I'm going to be talking about is in a fish eye. And it, it's not just arbitrary that I picked a fish eye. You'll see, uh, you'll see after a while why, uh, why I picked fish. There's a special reason for it. This is, a, this is a fish. And here is the fish's lens. It has a spherical lens that's fancier than it looks because it is designed in a way so, the, uh, so that the refractive index changes with the radius out to get rid of spherical aberration. It's really quite amazing. It makes, uh, it makes the, uh, this is the nerve right here that sends information to the brain. And this nerve uh, is a is a bundle of, uh, of axons in, in you, about a million, in the fish, uh, maybe 100,000, 50,000. And the, uh, the lens makes a, a image of the world on the retina, and the retina is, is, uh, is right here. It's a very thin, uh, a very thin sheet that I'm going to be describing better. And here is a segment of the retina right here. And the segment of the retina looks like this. It's about 100 microns thick. And it has essentially three layers. You can, ease, you can say that it has three layers. This first layer, uh, okay, here's the, f here is, I'm going to call this one layer one, this one layer two, and this one layer three. And layer one is the input layer. And it has photoreceptors in it, and the image of the eye, the light from the photons from the eye, come through the retina, which is clear. All the all the layers. Uh, this is one, two, and three. Layers two and three are clear, so the light goes right through them, and then they get, and, the, and the photons get absorbed by very fancy molecular structures in layer one, the input layer, and get turned into electrical signals. Then the second layer here is a processing layer.
and layer three is an output layer. And layer three is where the neurons are that send their information back to the, uh, back to the, to the brain. And, uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, give a little bit more information about, uh, about layer three now. So here is, oops, sorry. Here is layer three. This is the output layer of the retina. This is just a small piece of retina. And we're, and we're going to look at a, a small square right here. And we're looking down on this square. And that is over here. So now this is looking right down on the square. And what you see there are a bunch of nerve cells that are called retinal ganglion cells. And there's one here, and one there, and one there, and one there, and one there. And each of these retinal ganglion cells has dendrites. And here are, uh, here are some of the dendrites. And those dendrites sample the information in layer, in, in layer three. This is layer three. They sample the information coming from layer one through layer two, where, where the information is being processed. And the axons of cells in the, pro, in the intermediate layer, in the hidden layer, uh, they send their information up and display it over the, the uh, in, a, in a lamina uh, in, in a, a sheet underneath uh, underneath layer one layer three. This is the sheet right here, and then the dendrites of these cells here, and they're, they're called RGCs, uh, called retinal ganglion cells. The dendrites of these retinal ganglion cells sample the information about the world, and then they encode it as nerve impulses and send it back to the fish's brain or to your brain, as the case may be. Now, the retinal ganglion cells have a very interesting property, and that is that their dendrites just barely overlap, but they never touch each other, and they form uh, and they tile the retina. And here are, and here is a piece of the uh, of the retina uh, that uh, the, uh, from up above, where the person who did this has drawn circles around the area sampled by each one of the retinal ganglion cells. So each retinal ganglion cell is responsible for reporting on the information from one part of the image in the retina, which corresponds to one part in the world. These, uh, so the retina is covered by a bunch of pixels, and the area of each pixel is A, and the area of the entire retina, this is the pixel area, And the capital A is the retina area. That's the area of this whole sheet of cells that's collecting information. OK, at this point now, I can, uh, I can tell you what the question is I'm going to be answering and what the answer is going to be. And then I have to tell you why, uh, and then the rest of the, of the talk, which is, another, which is another 40 minutes or so, is going to be designed to explain to you uh, why this is a general principle. And then I'll, at the very end, I'll tell you what we don't know and why we need to know it. Okay, so the question is, how big should a, a pixel area be? And on the one hand, it should be as small as possible. Uh, it should be as small as possible because you want the biggest megapixel camera you can get to encode the image sending back to the brain. 
On the other hand, every pixel should be as big as it can in order to average noise because the image is very noisy and you're looking at only a very small number of cells, information from them, it's a noisy image. And so the bigger it is, the more you can average and the more accurately the brain knows what the light intensity in your pixel is. And so, uh, so there's going to be a, a, a fight between the pixel, uh, determining the pixel area, a fight between how accurately you can know and how fine the resolution is. And what I'm going to claim is, the, the general principle I'm going to claim is that, that, the, that there are multiple solutions that you can think of for dealing with this problem, but I'm going to be claiming that the solution that the brain uses is to exactly balance the uh, signal to noise and the resolution, so the ratio of those quantities uh, is a constant, and so neither one gets to dominate as you make retinas bigger and smaller. Okay, and then I'm going to be telling you how you would uh, apply this same idea to other parts of the brain. And by the way, I forgot to, uh, I, I often do, you, you know, I'm glad to have questions at any time. Uh, and I, I would, I, in fact, I would greatly welcome questions because uh, uh, that, that'll give everyone a chance to kind of uh, internalize what's being said if, if it's unfamiliar to you. And um, uh, yes, there are axons, but you can't see them. The, the axons are coming from layer two, and they're spread in the same in, in the same layer where these where, at the same uh, sheet where the where these are. But you, you, they aren't they, you don't see them there. And these dendrites are covered with uh, with uh, synapses from those axons. And generally speaking, a particular part of the world there makes an image here, and th and that and that image is encoded by one retinal ganglion cell. So they they all they all cover the whole world and don't mix it up. The rods and cones are in layer one. That's the sensory layer. And so the light goes, it kind of seems backwards, but the light goes through, the, through all of the circuitry, gets to the rods and cones. In the rods and cones, it gets turned into electrical signals and then sent back out to the, to the inner part of the eye. And the reason for that is, that you, you, you want to minimize light scattering. And so you have the receptor layer at the bottom here. And then you have a pigment layer, a black pigment layer that covers that. And so any light that doesn't get absorbed never gets reflected or scattered or anything. It's just, it's, it's just absorbed by this black pigment layer. And so it's a, it's a, it seems like a kind of difficult way of doing this. But, it's a, but it, makes, it makes sense when you, when you think about it. Yeah. OK. Oops. There's still things I'm uh, not understanding about how to use this. OK, so I'm interested in the scalable architecture of neural circuits. And if you're going to study scalable architectures, you have to have neural circuits that come in different sizes, but you believe are the same circuit. And it turns out that there are a couple of ways to do this. You'll hear one, another one later. But one of the best ways to study scalable architectures is to study fish. And the reason is that fish, unlike us, grow their entire lives. They never stop growing. An old fish is a big fish. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And unlike us, where we have all of the nerve cells we're going to have essentially when we're born, the fish make new nerve cells their entire life. As the fish gets bigger, its eye gets bigger, its brain gets bigger, it makes new cells, but all the old cells are there, but they, but they, but, but they, but they make, it makes new ones around the periphery and it readjusts things so that the circuits, uh, 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 same circuits are being used no matter how big the fish is. And so what I've shown here in A, B, and C are the eyes from three goldfish, a small goldfish in C, a medium-sized goldfish in B, and a big goldfish in A. And 
Uh, the, 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 I'm going to be showing you some experimental data, and this was done by a, a, a technician in my laboratory whose name is uh, uh, Sun Hua Li, what was in my laboratory. And Sun Hua wanted to get in graduate school, and she wanted to have a publication, and so, uh, so this, uh, this is the thing that we did for her to, to uh, have, a, have a publication, and she did all the experiments and did a beautiful job, and I, I did the little theoretical stuff you'll be hearing about. Now down below here is a um, is the way the retinal ganglion cells uh, uh, look and what you do is there's a crystal, a lipophilic, a lipophilic crystal uh, that's called di-I that only diffuses through the surface membranes of cells and you put a little uh, a little a, crystal, a little piece of that a crystal of that of that dye into the nerve and this red this red um, uh, dye right there is uh, is that um, is, is di-I crystal that was put there. It diffuses up into the uh, cells and you can find individual cells. And then you have to say, well, how big are the pixels? And what you do is you draw a convex hull, a convex polygon around the outside of this, touching all the, the points. And, here, and here's the one that was actually used. And by, for many reasons, that's a valid way of measuring the pixel size. And the pixel area is, as I said, A, and it's measured just that way by putting this convex hull around the dendritic tree that's sampling the information. And then capital A here is the, uh, is the retinal area. And so what, I, so what I'm going to actually be doing is formulating an extremely simple theory about how the fish might deal with the question, how big should I make my pixels? And then I'm going to show you data where we measured the area of the retina. That's how big, this, that's how big the neural circuit is. And we measured the pixel area, and we compared it with the various alternative theories. OK, so you recall that I said before that there, are, uh, that there, there is a little tussle between resolution and accuracy in how big you want to make a pixel. And resolution is I'm going to call rho. And uh, nu I'm going to call the signal to noise ratio. And <clears throat> resolution, uh, and there are two physical principles that you use for getting these by understanding what the basic mechanisms are. What's happening is that you have all these pixels and you're sampling the image. And so you can figure out what the pixel, what the, what the resolution is from Nyquist sampling theorem. And the resolution is equal to or proportional to the square root of the retinal area divided by the pixel area, which is proportional to n, and n is the number of pixels. And, uh, and the reason is the square root is because you want the linear resolution in one direction. Yes? So is that exact A over A and the so pixels overlap the um, It's proportional to it. They overlap. So each one of these pixels is actually, the, uh, is actually a, if you look at just the density of the dendritic uh, arbor that's sampling, it's a Gaussian that is truncated at the edge of the arbor at two standard deviations from the center. And each pixel overlaps. And, and I didn't, I'm, there are things I haven't been telling you. And, and there are actually many classes of retinal ganglion cells. And these different retinal ganglion cells each tile the retina. And so there are a dozen or two dozen versions of the image of the world that's encoded in, in slightly different ways and sent back to the brain for processing.
And each one of those is, is on a hex, each one of the retinal ganglion cells is on a slightly noisy hexagonal array, and they overlap by, uh, it's, it's three standard deviations uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the sampling uh, uh, function, three standard, they're, they're, the, the, uh, the, ed, the, the distance apart is three standard deviations, they overlap by one, but it's always the same for everything. All, no matter how big the, 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 the retinal ganglion cells are or, or uh, other things about them. So, so th this is, th this is a, 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 reasonable, uh, a, a reasonable approximation, they're proportional. Okay, the signal to noise ratio, and this is Nyquist. The signal to noise ratio is gotten from Campbell's theory, theorem, And many of you will, most people don't care anything about shot noise anymore, but, uh, but the, the people who study, who study uh, probabilistic phenomena still, still uh, know about it. It used to be a, a big deal in the days of, uh, of electron tubes, but with transistors, it's, it, it's, still, it's still there, but, it's, but it's, it's not, it doesn't take the prominent role that it used to. And, I bet yes, <laughs> and and so the uh, and so what happens is that the retinal ganglion cell samples the neural information that's being encoded by nerve impulses, and every time one of the one of the cells that that pr does the processing sends information to the retinal ganglion cell, there is a little shot of current that flows into the cell, and those all get summed up. Uh, th thousands of them, and so basically you're having uh, you 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 the noise is coming from uh, 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 fundamentally uh, there, there are other reasons for it, but fundamentally it's coming from shot noise, and so Campbell's theorem says an S is the number of synapses. that one neuron has, and Campbell's theorem tells us that the, that the, uh, that the signal to noise ratio, S is the average, and the square root, this, um, here, I'm gonna, Okay. The, the signal to noise ratio is proportional to the number of synapses divided by the square root of the number of synapses. That's basically that's basically a version of Campbell's theorem, and the number of synapses is proportional to the area that we saw before uh, 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 the square root of the area that we saw before. And that's a property, an experimentally known and also theoretically derived property, uh, that says that says uh, how uh, uh, how many synapses you get on a neuron that has a pixel size of size A, and so this is equal to A to the one half divided by A to the one fourth equals a to the one fourth. Okay, those are the signal to noise. That's the. So I'm going to be talking about these two quantities, and only thing I'm going to do, except using algebra, is use these these two relationships in the in the in the next part of the talk. Yeah. Um, no, because the frequency depends. The frequency that that, uh, that the variance is a times the shot squared, and the noise. The, 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 uh, because the number of synapses, because there, there's a constant frequency coming. Basically, if, if a constant light, there's a constant frequency coming over each synapse, and so the total number of of of, of shots per second is is uh, is proportional to s, which is the number of synapses. And the, and but you want the standard deviation to get the signal to noise, and that's for the variance. What? 
the, because the, 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 reason, the, the reason you want the number of, of synapses is because each, each cell that's sending synapses is giving about a constant frequency, and you want to know the total frequency at which the shots are arriving. That's S times whatever the whatever the, the rate is, and then you multiply that t times the integral of the of the shot squared. That gives you the variance, but you want the standard deviation on one cell. Oh, <laughs> uh, there 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 are three reasons. And I'll give you one, I, and I can I can show you the other one. There's one that's this that, that's a this is, it's a sort of neat way of deriving it. It's because that the length of the arbor, if you just add it all up, is proportional for these two-dimensional arbors to the area to the one-half power. For a, an arbor that has a volume, it, it's it, 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 it's the length is proportional to the volume to the one-half power. Same reason for both of them. That's an experimental fact, so that's a reason we have, reasonable way of taking it. And then, uh, and then the number of synapses is proportional to the length for these cells. Okay. Okay. So there are three theories you can think of, at least three theories you can think of, and the first one is best resolution. Well, what, maybe what evolution has done is it has selected a, a, a size of a retinal ganglion cell so the signal to noise is tolerable. It, it's okay. And then it says, I want to put all of my eggs in the, in the resolution basket. What I really care about is resolution. I don't care so much about the accuracy because evolution has picked a, a, a pixel size that is pretty accurate accurate enough for me. And so from then on, what I'm going to do is when I make my retina bigger and the fish makes more cells, I'm going to keep the, the size of the pixel just constant. That way I'm increasing the pixels as much as it'll fit in, and, uh, and that will give me the best resolution. And for that, A is a constant. It's proportional to 1. And log A is proportional to a constant. Maybe what the brain really cares about is that it wants to know for sure what the light intensity in every pixel is. And, it, it, and it, so it selects a sampling, uh, uh, it, it, sele it selects a sampling uh, density that, that gives it adequate resolution. But then what it does is, as the retina gets bigger, it it keeps the same uh, it keeps the same number of pixels, but it makes every pixel bigger. And as the retina gets bigger, then you have the same resolution, but the signal to noise gets better and better and better. This is best accuracy. And. This says that A, the pixel area, is proportional to the retinal area, or that log of A is equal to log. This doesn't always work. Log of capital A plus a constant. Or maybe you do what you'd want to do is what I said before, and that is you'd say a mix. You want to take a mix of these things. You want the resolution to get better and better and better. You want the signal to noise to get better and better and better. But you never want either one of those things to dominate. In that case, what you would do is you would say that the resolution divided by the signal to noise ratio ought to be some constant. And if you go back to the, the, the things that I, I showed before, the, uh, the, the, the Campbell's theorem and Nyquist theorem, what you get is that A is proportional to the area of the retina to the 2 thirds power, or that log A 
is equal to, oops, log A is equal to log capital A plus a constant. So here, yeah. Oh, yes, right. Ab absolutely. Yeah, that's right. You, it could be, but, but, okay. So, so uh, there are two answers to that. The first one is that this is the one thing that never lets either of those two other alternatives grow bigger than the other one. They, they, they grow together. The other thing is that a lot of times, if you have a constant, a, a, a scaling exponent, and if it's one, people don't make a lot of fuss if you just assume it's one. <laughs> and so, but, but you're, you're exactly right. And, and in fact, it would still be a scalable, you can still have scaling nicely if you had any power function at all. And I recognize that. But, but this does have that one advantage of, of no, neither one of those two things. As these retinas go over a very large range of sizes. And so you would never have uh, resolution versus signal and noise dominate over the other. Yes? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, okay, so it's not constant over your retina. In fact, it is enormously different. It's very small in the middle, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then the size of the pixel size is very small in the middle, and then it gets big in the periphery. But, uh, but that's not true for the fish. The fish is like a camera, and that's another reason I didn't talk about, but that's another reason why I, why I chose them. Well, uh, yeah, but I'm not going to need to. <laughs> yeah, you'll see. You, well, I, I'm going to show you the data. Oh, yeah. And better than the end You'll see. You'll see. But, but Chuck, you can also imagine certainly different species of fish develop, uh, adopting any one of the strategies. Oh, and, and in fact... I, there's only been one species of fish ever looked at, and that's the two, two species, zebrafish and goldfish, and we did it. Nobody else has ever done this. Yeah, right, and they're exactly the same. It's really depends on whether it's predator, prey. They're, 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 well, the ratio of resolution to, uh, to signal and noise might be, it probably is different at fish who live very deep in the water or live in muddy water or something like that. But, um, uh, yes. But, but I'm going to give you an example. This is going to get generalized for your brain. And I'm going to give you an example later that, show, that, that, that chooses the best resolution strategy. Okay. Yeah, in order to prove a rule, you have to have an exception. That's the exception. Okay, here are the, here are the experiments that Sunwa did, and uh, this is a log-log plot, and the reason you have to do a log-log plot is because ideally with these scaling laws, you want to go over as many orders of magnitude as you can, and if you plot them linearly, they, the points all get lumped up together. And, and here, there are, there are the squares at the, at the very bottom down here are zebrafish. Oops, I forgot what... I forgot to do something. These, the red ones, are zebrafish, and these are goldfish. And we did those for various reasons. Uh, the, uh, the, there are two lines on there. There's a thin line and a thick line. And the thin line is the least squares fit that you just calculate, ordinary least squares to the, to the points. And the thick line is the line with a slope of 2 thirds. And you, couldn't, you can't even tell those apart statistically. And so there's, I can't say exactly what the scaling exponent would be if there's one there. But it's, it's not statistically different given the resolution I have from the, uh, from the 2 thirds. OK. Now, this is fine. This is fine, but this is just a fish retina. Who cares about that? Well, <clears throat> the fish, what, what, what happens to the axons from these retinal ganglion cells? These axons go back to the fish's tectum, 
and they make a map of the world on that tectum, and there are cells in the tectum that sample that map. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw what it looks like here, roughly. So here is, luckily the fish all have very square structures. So here is the tectum. And here is an axon coming back, coming from the retina. And it goes to a particular place here. And it spreads its information over a uh, over a, a, a little region here. And the fish is very clever how it does this. And what it does is it keeps all the things straight so there is a retinotopic map from the retina to the tectum. So if the fish is looking at the letter A, then the neural activity in the, in the tectum is displayed like the letter A there. OK, so the, in the upper layers, that's where the information gets spread out. And it's just the way the world is. And then in the lower layers, there, uh, and so here is a region. And this, I'm making a, a cylinder that goes down here. And, in, and inside this cylinder, is a neuron, and its cell body is down at the bottom. And the way the fish is organized is that this layer down here is where all the cell bodies are. There's a sheet of them, and they send all their dendrites up to sa sample. And so here's the cell, and it sends its dendrites up, and it samples information in a region of the map. As the fish grows, the retina grows, the tectum grows, it adds more nerve cells. And so the, the, these cells in the tectum have exactly the same problem that the, uh, that the retina has. Because, uh, because the retina gets bigger. And does, it, does, and does each one of these cells keep its pixel the same size, best resolution? Does it increase its pixel in proportion to the area of the, uh, of the tectum, best, uh, uh, best accuracy? Or does it use the same mixed strategy that, that, that was used before? Okay, and uh, there are two ways of doing this. And I'm going to tell you, uh, and, and we've actually done both ways, but I'm going to tell you about a, an alternative way of testing this theory. The theory that I told you before basically said that we had a relationship between the area of the pixel and the area of the, of the, um, uh, of the map. It's not convenient to measure the pixel sizes the way we did before, where you, you fill lots of cells with dye and you measure them. It's, it's just very hard to do that. So there's an alternative way to do it, which I can explain. It's just algebra again. It's not hard, but, it's, uh, but it, it, it involves uh, more information than I have time to talk about. And that is that you can transform this theory into another theory where the variables are the number of neurons in the tectum versus the volume of the tectum. What this comes down to is it comes down to knowing how many synapses uh, uh, is re how many synapses these cells in the tectum have as a, as a function of their pixel area, and we have information that tells us that. And and another thing we need to know is how big is the map. And we have information about that. That's basically the number of uh, the total number of cells that, you're, that, that, are, that are in there. And the third piece of information is the fact that the number of synapses that you have in a unit volume is always the same. There are about a billion synapses per microliter of brain. And that doesn't change with the size of the volume. And you put those things together and do some algebra, and you come out with with a uh, with three theories the best resolution theory says that the log of n is equal to the log of v 
plus a constant. V is the volume of the tectum. N is the number of cells in the tectum. The second alternative is that the log of N is equal to 3 sevenths times the log of V. This is best resolution. This is best signal to noise. And the third one is log of n is equal to two-thirds log of v. And this is the mixed one. Now, we've actually checked with the tectum, the old way I told you about before and this way. Uh, but, I'm, but I presented this way to save time and because it's going to be used uh, in, in, a, in a minute about with some other things. Okay. So here is the volume of the tectum on the abscissa, the number of neurons in millions uh, in the tectum on the, uh, on the uh, ordinate, and the circles are the data from a bunch of fish, and the line here is is put on there with with a slope of two thirds. It may not be exactly two thirds, but two thirds is a pretty good fit. Okay, so what we can say is it looks like hmm? what what's that? Oh, th those are data points fr from the fish. So we, we counted the number of neurons, and, we, and the air bars are, are uh, inside the circles. I put pretty big circles on. Um, and and uh, uh, so this looks pretty good. Now, I need to take a step back and, and, and talk about something else, and that is that what people believe is, and in some cases know for sure, that your whole brain is made of areas that are maps. They're all maps of something. Sometimes we don't know what it's a map of. Sometimes we do know what it's a map of, but there are always maps there. And if you compare, say, a bunch of primates, the brain gets bigger, the maps get bigger. And so these primates, but, they, but we believe that the circuits are the same between us and a chimpanzee and, a, and other, other primates. So as the, as the maps get bigger, we have the same problem that the fish has. Are we going to do best resolution, best accuracy, or mixed? And fortunately, there's quite a bit of data in the literature. The, 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 all the data I've shown you so far is stuff that, that, uh, that a graduate student named Andrea Pillai, uh, who's in Singapore now, and Sun Hua did. They did the experiments. But, uh, but from now on, it's, it's literature data. And, and so there's already data in the literature where people have counted the number of neurons and measured the volume of a bunch of different structures. And this is on the next on the next slide. A, B, C, and D are three different groups of different experiments. B is one, two, is six nuclei in the thalamus. The thalamus is something that gets information from the outside and sends that information up to the cortex or something like that. And there's a woman named Este Armstrong who measured the, who counted the number of neurons in the thalamus of great apes and measure, of, of all the, of these six nuclei, and counted the number of neurons and measured the um, volumes. And she put a table, but she never actually bothered to plot the, plot the data. And I plotted it for her. And, uh, and uh, yes. So, so the, the, reason vo the, the reason volume matters is that for any one of these neural structures, essentially all of the volume is taken up by neuropil. 
only a small fraction is taken up by cell bodies and blood vessels and so forth. And so the volume basically tells you how many synapses there are in there. If you know the number of cells and you know the total number of synapses, then you know the number of synapses per cell and we're sort of back to where we were before. Okay, so, so, the, so a volume on every one of these plots is on the uh, abscissa and number of neurons on the ordit log-log scales. All of the lines are a slope of two-thirds. There are no adjustable parameters any place in this business. A is two different nuclei from a bunch of primates, non-human, non-grade 8 primates, and there are two classes of cells in the lateral geniculate. One is parvocellular and layers and, mag mag and magnocellular, it's just different things, and they were counted separately. Uh, S.D. Armstrong counted all of the neurons in the, in the nuclei of the great apes, that includes us. Another paper counted the neurons in the dorsal and ventral claustrum, which is just a part of the brain, measured the area. And uh, another paper uh, counted uh, five different brainstem nuclei, like the locus ceruleus is one people may have heard of. And all I did was go to the, and actually there's more stuff here. I did, this is not all of the, uh, uh, this is all the things I had uh, with me. Uh, but there are a couple of other places where, where the same plots work just equally well. And all I did is I went to the literature, I wrote down the numbers they had for the number, the number of neurons, I wrote down the volume, I, uh, I uh, plotted it out, and I put on a, a best-fitting line, I just I adjusted the intercept, so the best-fitting line with a slope of, of two-thirds. Okay, so uh, here it looks like this is, a, it, this is a good candidate general principle. That that uh, that what the uh, that what the brain wants to do is it wants to keep this balance between signal to noise and accuracy so neither one dominates. Uh, the one question is is that always true? And the answer is no. The one exception that I know is in the in, is in the neocortex, where in the neocortex. The, the best resolution strategy uh, is what's used. The, the number of synapses per neuron between you and a mouse in the cortex is, uh, is barely different. Your cortex is, uh, is a thousand times bigger than a mouse's, uh, but, you, but you only have a couple of times more synapses per neuron. It gets barely, the cortex gets barely thicker. And the way the cortex works is you add on more modules, and each module calculates something, and, uh, and that's designed, apparently, to calculate so, so you get the best resolution that you can by making the cortex bigger. Oh, probably, um, probably 20 or 30. They're all primates. No, no, they're not all primates. They're, 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 they're I can't remember what they are. I didn't look back. I can't remember what they are now. But they're not all primates. They, uh, the, 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 t the top two are primates. The bottom ones aren't. But I can't remember what they were. Probably car carnivores is probably some were carnivores. I don't remember the others. Okay, so. Um, I'll, I'm going to say one last thing, and then uh, and then I, I'm glad to take questions and let people go. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is a candidate principle now that looks pretty good, and it's it's amazing that all these things are this that er, that everything is this orderly. You're li you're glad in biology when you can find stuff this orderly. But there are two things that you always need to know when you do things like this. The first thing you need to know is, what's the mechanism? What is there about development or the way the gene systems for pattern formation are, are designed or something that gives you this? And I have no idea what that is. But there are other general principles like this, like how big the brain is, that I'm actually collaborating with somebody on to try to get at what the genetic and, and developmental basis is. Uh, the other thing is. You always want to know why did the brain do it this way? Okay, it's fine to say, oh yes, you need to have good signal to noise and and good resolution. That makes that makes kind of intuitive sense, but it's but exactly how much sense that makes depends on what calculations are being done. 
And so a really satisfactory version of this theory would say, this is, the this is the classes of calculations the brains are doing, and in order to do those calculations well or optimally or something like that, what you'd need to do is you'd need to make sure that, you, that your signal-to-noise ratio was always as good as it could be and, didn't do and, and, and the resolution was good, but neither one dominated. And, uh, and, I, and I have no idea, uh, in this case, what, what, the resolu what, the, what the calculations are that need to be done that, uh, that would let you, uh, let you, that would want to have you have this principle. But what I've done here is I've used, uh, uh, the, the, the basically, in, a, in an extremely simple way, exactly the way a physicist would do this. You figure out a question. And then you figure out a way to get some traction on that question, alterna different alternatives or something that has to be true that you know has to be true. You formalize it, and then you go and you check. And so I think that, that even though this is so simple, it's kind of boring, that, that, uh, that, that this general principle is one that will go a long ways in biology if people, uh, if people think hard about the questions, and then formalize them nicely. Thank you. Questions? Uh, David? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, one, one possibility with this proposition is uh, um, present or operative um, during development and then reaches Yes. But the question is, you have to, you could also look for experimental data among the end of development, say, a primary jury statistic, see whether the exponents start out two thirds, which they couldn't, presumably. Yeah. It doesn't even make sense. You don't have the experimental methods to establish it. Yes. But do they approach two thirds? Well, the. Um, start it, it's uh, it, it's it's hard. It's it, uh, um, so the the way that the way that 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 the brain is designed is in the in mammals, you you make all the cells that you're going to have. The cells know who they are. They know where to go. And after the cells are in place, then you grow your circuits, and the circuits. Are, are very dependent on, uh, on the activity that's going on. And so it, it would probably not be too much of a stretch to be able, you have to figure out a way of testing it, but to be able to figure out a theory how this, how this adjusted itself. And, uh, and, that, that, and, and, you could, and you could maybe test that. Uh, that and that, that's, that would be my favorite, that would be my favorite theory for it. But uh, I, have, I haven't really thought hard about it. Yes. And you showed some examples in the uh, so generally where would this technique apply? If they don't use examples. Uh I um so I I I would I I would guess that that it apply it applies in the retina because you have pixels there, and you want to do things with those pixels, combine information from various kinds of, of, of recept photoreceptors and motion detection and stuff like that. Send that information on someplace else. And I think that any time you're keeping, you're keeping uh, all the information kind of, kind of uh, together, Combining and so forth, but you have a very simple map, and you and you and you form versions of that map, and send it someplace. Then then you're then you're going to want to do this, but the cortex is doing something really quite different, because for example, if you count if you count the number of neurons in the primary visual cortex, and you count the number of neurons that are feeding information to the primary visual cortex. What you have is that the number of neurons that feed the information, the number of neurons that, that process the information is proportional to the number of neurons that feed the information to the three halves power. 
that three halves comes because what you do when you go to uh, to to the uh, LG, from the retina to the visual cortex is you take a two-dimensional map of the world and you turn it into a three-dimensional map of the world where you you worry about the x y but also the angle at which uh, at which a line is passing through any point and then you're doing a calculation based on those on those data plus some other ones and I think that probably is just a more complicated calculation that you take a whole assembly of cells that 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 does that does some calculation and and use those together and that case just making it bigger wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't help you very much that would be my guess yes yes so, So, so the so the, the the way that the way that retinas work is that they <clears throat> they they have they have big recept they have big retinal ganglion cells they have very small retinal ganglion cells they have mechanisms for stabilizing the image uh, things like that and so I, I don't know in detail but I would guess that it's imposed on you how fast things move around you and uh, and you and you don't get to sample. Because there, the guy that's going to eat you is determining how long your sample time is going to be, and so they probably have to take that into account and do it fast. But then they have other mechanisms to uh, get better resolution or better, um, uh, you know, optimize resolution and optimize um, uh, the um, uh, the signal to noise to get accuracy for light and pixels and things like that. But I don't, I don't actually know. Yes. Yeah. So as a control case to see that this is really due to the computational principle of the brain. If you would say take the number of cells in, in the liver versus the volume, would that, how, is that known how that scales? Uh, I think it's just proportional. Well, say because I mean, it might be just the cell. The liver cells are all about this. A fixed relation. That's no, the liver. The, the liver cells are are all about the are all about the uh, like a mouse and our liver cells are the same size. Most of the cells, many of the cells in the body, are 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 the same. Blood cells are the same as us in mice, and uh, and this is a special a special case where where your the cell is, is is a little different in size the cell body is but the dendrite is 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 changes a lot between different types of cells and so forth and so that's something that they that the cells are caring about how how much how much they're sampling oh, Fred, Fred had a question Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Uh, that, that, that's, that, that, is, that is part of the, of, the, of the interesting question about it. Yeah, so in the, the, the uh, people can go if they, if they, if they, they don't have to stay. I'll, I'll just tell you an interesting fact about fish uh, retinas. Uh, the retina is round like this. As the fish grows bigger, the retina grows bigger. But it, it, it keeps all the cells it had since it was a baby fish in the middle. And it adds new annually of cells around the outside. But the ones in the middle grow bigger. Then the, 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 the stem cells that grow those cells are in a circle. Then it goes back to the tectum. And the cells that make new tectal cells are in a kind of a horseshoe like that. And so the shape of the tectum is not circular. It's kind of changing as the fish gets older. And so not only do the axons from these cells have to go to the right place to keep the map of the world right, what they have to do is they grow bigger. The, 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 the retinal cell, the axons of these cells grow the same way as the, as the uh, um, that follow the same scaling laws for size as the, as the retinal ganglion cells do. But they also have to migrate across the surface of the, of the, of the, te of the tectum. This, is, this was studied, um, uh, this was studied uh, qu quite a few years ago, but people aren't studying it much now. So, so the map is always being adjusted by these arbors growing bigger and actually crawling across the, the surface of the uh, of the of the map, it's, it's quite amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, the, you 
you actually answered part of it, which was as you grow, it, it, the pixel size, for this to work, things would have to kind of nudge each other, which you just explained. Yeah. But you know, when I think of maps, almost none of them do I want to have accuracy and resolution to always be traded off. In the, every map in, the, in my brain is highly distorted and often to favor either resolution or accuracy, depending on whether I'm in the small of my back or the tip of my finger. Did you ask whether that, that changes? I think you're thinking more about cortical maps than subcortical maps. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, the, <clears throat> the, the mapping is done by what's being projected onto there. And that's what, and, and, and so the reason, the reason in the somatosensory system, your, your, thing, your hands and your lips and so forth, they're so big, is because they have a lot of sensors there. And then the map is spread out to represent the number of, the number of, of, of sensors. And so you might imagine that you, you want to do your calculations based on the number of sensors. So that it doesn't have to be a, a map that we would like. I mean, that looks good to us. It has to, just has to be whatever the brain has to use to do its calculations. Calculations the best. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.